you cannot come to Jesus and just patronize him as a noble, good Jewish teacher because he crossed a line. He crossed a severe line and the Jews saw that. Either he's the Messiah or he is a blasphemer and he needs to be put to death. And those are really the choices you have. So you're about to witness a rare moment where Ben Shapiro, he gets humbled on his own show, The Ben Shapiro Show, when Pastor John MacArthur comes on here and completely corrects him on his misunderstandings of Jesus and even goes on to show him the Old Testament prophecies in Isaiah 53 that directly show the prediction of Jesus' coming. It gets very interesting here. I'm going to let this one play out and then I'm going to give my thoughts in the back end. Let's get into it. When I read the New Testament myself and I obviously I'm not a believer in the divinity of Jesus, but when I see what Jesus actually has to say about the Old Testament, it seems to me very similar to the stuff that Zechariah is saying or that Jeremiah is saying. Sure. Right? Jeremiah says that the, the sacrifices themselves are basically of no use unless there's actual meaning behind the sacrifices. God wasn't there because he likes the barbecue, right? It actually has to have some meaning. And when Jesus comes along and he says, you're focusing in on all the details of the Sabbath without actually recognizing the rationale for the Sabbath. And then he exaggerates it beyond the point. It's, it's interesting. Without he loving actually, God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right, exactly. And then he, even to make a point, exaggerates it beyond the scope of what Jewish law would permit. So, for example, when he says, you're going to leave a guy to die in a ditch on the Sabbath, that's against Jewish law. You can't do that. You have to violate the Sabbath in order to save a life. This is like basic black letter Jewish law. But he's making a point, which is, you guys are ignoring what's important in order to focus in on the mundane aspect of of practice. Like that is, that's not unique to Jesus. In other words, there's a, there's a long prophetic tradition of people saying exactly that. And in the modern Jewish world, it's called Musar. It's basically just telling people what they should understand about the values beyond the, beyond the black letter law. And this is why I think it's, it's fascinating to me when I talk with people who are real biblical scholars in the, from the Christian side, that all the era, a lot, no, I won't say all, a lot of the areas where Christian scholars think that Christianity has departed dramatically from Judaism, I think are not really dramatic departures. They seem to be reflections of Judaism from a slightly different angle. Even so far as a lot of the stuff in the Sermon on the Mount about, you know, love when, when it says that you're supposed to uh, love thy brother as thyself and, and you're supposed to, um, and, and you're supposed to uh, treat your brother as you would wish to be treated and all, sure. all of this. I mean, that's, that's present in the Old Testament, too. No, right? I, I think what Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount was elevate the teaching of the rabbis. Elevate it. He went b above them. Yep. He, he said, um, well, you, you've been told you shouldn't commit adultery. I'm telling you, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. He got to the heart of the law. Uh, they were content with the, the practical application of the law. He was not content with that. So I, I would say that Jesus was the purest Jew that ever lived <laughs> because he understood the, the, the elevation of the law to the heart and the soul. Um, it, would be a, it would be a monstrous responsibility for some committee to have invented Jesus. Uh, the, you know, when you hear the, even the people in his time saying, never a man spoke like this man, <laughs> that he is a person that doesn't seem to have been a product of human invention. And you could say, well, Jesus is a good teacher, but good teachers don't claim to be God. They don't say, I and God are one. They don't say, I created the universe. Th that's not a good teacher. That's somebody who's crazy, as a lunatic, or somebody who's trying to pull off a huge deception. So you, you, you cannot come to Jesus and just patronize him as a noble, good Jewish teacher because he crossed a line he crossed a severe line, and the Jews saw that. Either he's the Messiah, or he is a blasphemer, and he needs to be put to death. And those are really the choices you have. So when you ask me to show the, the variation between Judaism and Christianity, morally, no, there's none. And in terms of God, the same, we don't have the same God as Muslims. Allah is not the same God as Jehovah. We don't have the same gods as any other false religion, but we have the same God as Jews and Christians. He is the one true creator God, the one true living God. He has a seity. That is, he is eternal by his own nature. He is uncreated, the uncreated one. We believe he is, he is more than one person in one God. That's why Genesis says, let us make man in our own image. And relationship comes from a God who has relationship within himself. But the distinction between Christianity and Judaism is what we do with Jesus Christ. Um, 
The writer of Hebrews says, if a sacrifice had been enough to atone for sin, they would have stopped making them. But they never stopped. Morning and evening, morning and evening, morning and evening, morning and evening. You know, basically a priest was a butcher. He had blood up to his waist. <laughs> right? I mean, That's he, true. That's he, true. he was a butcher. He had blood up to his waist. And the frustration of it, even on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, all the bloodletting, uh, and year after year after year after year, this goes on, this goes on, this goes on. You have this most amazing thing. You come to the death of Jesus Christ, and at the death of Christ, the veil in the temple is rent from top to bottom. The Holy of Holies is thrown open. Wow, that's a statement from God, because it couldn't have been ripped by men from the top down. The way to God is open. There's no more barriers because a, a suitable sacrifice has been found. This is the Lamb of God. And amazingly, soon after that, the whole sacrificial system ends because th that's the final sacrifice. And God validates that sacrifice by raising him from the dead. The resurrection is a provable historical fact. So I think that's the issue. Um, it's what do you do with Jesus. He was God's lamb, uh, a spotless lamb without blemish. God put on him the sins of us all. This is a stunning theological truth because all the people who will ever believe through human history, their sins are covered by Christ. Even those who believed going back to Adam, they were, all of them ha had to have a sacrifice that paid the price for their sins, whether it happened before Christ, their belief, or after Christ, Christ is the focal point. So he bears in his body all the sins of all who would ever believe through human history. This is a stunning thing to think about. Um, God putting all the sin and all the punishment on him. People say, well, how could one person bear that? Um, the answer is because he's, 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 he's a cosmic person. He's, he's an eternal being. He's, he's vast beyond us with a capacity to take that punishment. So he gathers up all the punishment for all the sins of all the people because sin must be punished. God is holy. And uh, that frees God, satisfying his justice to offer grace to all who believe in him. Um, I think that the Jewish believers in the Old Testament who were true believers in God and who did repent were waiting for that sacrifice, knowing that no animal sacrifice ever did it because they had to go back and make another one and another one and another one. When is the one sacrifice going to come. And that's why that you know, Isaiah 53 chapter is so critical because that's the focal point. That's the focal point of Isaiah, by the way. Anyway, Isaiah, interesting book, 66 chapters, like the Bible. The first 40 um, are judgment, like kind of like the Old Testament. First uh, 39, like the Old Testament. And the 27 New Testament are about salvation. The 27 chapters about salvation, the first nine are the, the salvation of Israel from nations around it. The back nine are the salvation of the planet, the new heaven and the new earth. And the middle nine are the salvation of people personally and individually. And in the middle of the middle nine, you have Isaiah 53. It's unbelievable what that book of Isaiah, it's, it's, it pulls it all together. And as you narrow down and you end up with, he was wounded for our transgressions, and this becomes the confession of all who believe in Christ, including one day Israel. So um, I, I want to say this to you personally. Um, you are a testimony to um, the glory of God in man. I, I see the beauty of God's creation in you. I see... Um, He's starting to tear up a little bit. I, I see the use of reason and compassion and care. I, I see so many things in you. So I, I don't, I'm not denying that reflection of God in you, but I'm saying you either believe Jesus is the Savior or you don't, and that's the distinction. Now I have a question, and that's what is stopping Jews like Ben Shapiro here from seeing Jesus as the Messiah, despite all the compelling arguments in favor of him. And so there's a few things to talk about here. One being that Jews don't believe that Jesus properly fulfilled the messianic prophecies. A big one that I see talked about online is the prophecy in Ezekiel that's about the building the third temple of Israel. I mean, Jesus, you know, there wasn't any third temple construction constructed when Jesus was along here. So it seems like maybe he didn't fulfill this. Well, Christians counter this by saying two things here. 
One, in the book of Matthew, when he's talking about he will destroy, if you destroy the temple, he will raise it up in three days. They're saying that could mean the third temple. Or conversely, it could also mean that Jesus is going to create the third temple during his second coming. And there's a few other prophecies about this, like an era of peace. And then another one that's about bringing the knowledge of the God of Israel to all people. And Christians also say that that is going to come during the second coming. And there's another thing that Jews hold against Jesus, and it's that they don't believe that Jesus embodies the personal qualifications to be the Messiah. For one, they believe that Jesus contradicted the Torah, which, I mean, like on dealings with the Sabbath, which would make him a false prophet. And they, there's verses about this in the Old Testament, like in Deuteronomy, I'll put it on screen or something. But Christians counter, and even Jesus himself said that he did not come to change the law or to replace the law, but to fulfill the law. And the New, the New Testament even records that Jews had a misunderstanding of the Mosaic Covenant and twisted it into this sort of legalism that Jesus came to restore. Not all Jews, but the Pharisees, the Sadducees, you read about it there. Another thing that's interesting is they also don't believe that Jesus was a descendant of David. And this is interesting because Jesus, since he came from God through the virgin birth in Mary, he technically has no biological father. So... And in that time, the culture was you inherit your bloodline through your father. So how could he be a descendant of David? Well, there's genealogies recorded in the Gospels about Joseph that show that he is part of the bloodline of David. And the Jews say, well, adoption into the Davidic bloodline isn't enough. The Christians say adoption into it is enough. And there's also a whole lot of debate about the genealogies, but that's really complicated. We're not going to get into that here. And another thing that they that Jews hold against Jesus is that they believe that the biblical verses, the iconic ones referring to Jesus, are mistranslations. So, for example, the the prophecy that's about predicting him being birthed from a virgin. Well, that text can also be interpreted as him being born of a young woman. It doesn't have to be virgin. And another one is that Jesus will be crucified. But you can also translate it that it just his enemies will surround him because that word for gouged can also mean like a lion. And there are many other objections to Jesus that rabbinical Jews, I think I'm saying that right, have against Jesus. But I mean, both sides, they're going to disagree on things and people are going to find ways to use the evidence to support their beliefs. And I think what's underlying all of these intellectual duels going on surrounding Jesus and Christianity versus Judaism, it's something much deeper going on here. And it's that in Judaism, Jews don't believe that they need a personal savior. They don't believe that they are born in a state of sin. But the truth is, is that we are all born into a fallen state and that we all need a savior. And you can keep doing those sacrifices over and over, like recorded in the Mosaic Covenant, but that is not is that's not what's gonna bring you the everlasting savior, the one true savior that can cover all sins for your whole lifetime. He can clothe you in righteousness. And that is the lamb of God. It's Jesus. He is the ultimate fulfillment of everything that has led up to this. And to accept Jesus as your Lord and savior, you just need to believe in him and trust in him to be the only Lord of your life and to turn from any unrighteous ways that are in your life and just pursue him. God said that he gave Israel its spiritual blindness in the book of Romans. It's New Testament, so Jews, I mean, they're not, they they don't believe this here, but it said that um, he would cover their eyes from seeing and cover their ears from hearing. And so the best thing that we can do here is to pray for them, pray for all of the people in Israel, pray for all of the Jews who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that they will come to in communion with him and receive everlasting life and if you want to learn more about the evidence for god i recommend checking out the video on screen right about there have a great day happy new year too